is it just me? Or is there something just a little jarring about finding recurrent references to a major female author's legendary beauty and the drama of its eventual loss in the introduction to her definitive volume of short fictions? Specifically, I have in mind the otherwise highly laudable complete stories of Perez de Spector, published last year by New Directions, and with all due respect and gratitude to her devoted biographer and champion, Benjamin Moser, I couldn't help but wonder what saying this about this Spector might add to the understanding of her work, an unparalleled achievement in the history of Latin American letters. So I quote, if Clarice Lispector was a great artist, she was also a middle class wife and mother. When Clarice, once so gloriously beautiful, sees her body dirty with wrinkles and fat, her characters see the same decline in theirs. And when she confronts the final unraveling of age and sickness and death, they are beside her." End of quote. Reading this, I couldn't help but wonder, will future literary enterprises ever grace readers with commentary on a male author's physical appearance? <laughs> will tomorrow's scholars ever find relevant to point out, for instance, the inextricable link between a male author's bulging beer gut, <laughs> an onset of baldness, and his bleak view of human existence? <laughs> and hey, why not throw in erectile dysfunction? <laughs> All the more tragic if the author in question in his youth was a, hair, a heart prop, a real stuff. I truly do not mean to undermine the incredible work of those people making the spectre avail available to English language readers but to point out how, even in the year 2016, these remnants of the not so distant past in which women were not so, not, were, were treated not so equally to men, sneak up on us when we least expect it, and even when we're dispensing praise. And to give you an idea about the spirit of tonight's program, the women of Mexico. We have with us some of Mexico's most astonishing contemporary voices who couldn't resist taking apart what in the world that intriguing phrase the women of Mexico might hold. Mm -hmm. Among the things in store for you tonight are depictions of Mexican women in canonical works of fiction, and depictions of women by female authors and, you guessed it, not so canonical works of fiction and poetry. Revolutionary women, mythical women, exalted women, disappeared women, dazzling imaginative women, bossy women, etc. I'll stop myself before I give too much away. So I will, not to continue speaking, but what I wanted to do to sort of frame what follows is to read you two depictions of, of, of a Mexican woman, or of Mexican women. And one appears in Octavio Paz's uh, uh, masterpiece, Piedras or Sunstone, published in 1957. <laughs> so I will read you a few excerpts uh, in which he depicts women. A sudden presence like a burst of song, like the wind singing in a burning building, a glance that holds the world and all its seas and mountains dangling in the air, body of light filtered through an agate, thighs of light, belly of light, the bays, the solar rock, cloud-colored body, color of a brisk and leaping day. The hour sparkles and has a body. The world is visible through your body, transparent through your transparency. I travel my way through galleries of sound. I flow among echoing presences. I cross transparencies as though I were blind. The reflection erases me. I'm born in another. O oh, forest of pillars that are enchanted, through arches of light I travel into the quarters of a diaphanous fall. I travel your body like the world, your belly is a plaza full of sun, your breast two churches where blood performs its own parallel rites, my glances cover you like ivy. You are a city, the, si the sea of salts. A stretch of ramparts split by the light, in two halves the color of peaches, a domain of salt, rocks, and birds, under the rule of oblivious noon. Dressed in the color of my desires, you go your way naked as my thoughts. I travel your eyes like the sea. Tigers drink their dreams in those eyes. The hummingbird burns in those flames. I travel your forehead like the moon, like the cloud that passes through your thoughts. I travel your belly like your dreams. And I wanted to compare that to a poem by a wonderful Mexican poet 
Enriqueta Ochoa, who was born in 1928, and she died in 2008 at 90. And uh, this poem was written in 1949, so it's a view of a woman, by a woman, and it's contemporary with the other one. Triple Room. My mother bequeathed me three maidens. The one who lives in the heights, entirely made of light, of the golden air through which the sun inhabits us. The one attending with me, an animal pen surrounded by a tall wire fence, severe frown, institution, and the one below, blazing tigers and the languor of a summer night. The three bore children within me like arteries, children made of damp presences in the fluctuating insides of my veins. They grew off on my they grew off my blood, and I grew in their multiple substances. Our nourishment was reciprocal, but a wall is a wall and it encloses. And like the stem that a bud bursts, they outgrew my structure off in their flight of gazelles, they relentlessly fused fence and wall. Their threefold presence becoming more blatant, they urged me to the sun and privileges, and their sabers wounded me so deeply that I went mute and mad at their whims. All of me they left transfigured in the obsidian fire of their gaze. Now, we go to Valeria Lucelli. I just want to say, Monica was like, oh yeah, last night I translated this poem by Enrique Tacho, maybe I'll read it. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start by reading this very short fragment, and then I'll explain it a bit. La Perlotti, let us call her thus, practice the profession of vampire but without commercialism a la Hollywood. She was by temperament insatiable and untroubled. She was seeking, perhaps, notoriety, but not money. Out of pride, perhaps, she had not been able to derive economic advantages from her figure, almost perfectly and eminently sensual. We all know her body because she served as a gratuitous model for the photographer, and her bewitching nudes were fought over. So this little fragment appears in, um, in Jose Vasconcelos's autobiography, and it refers to Tina Modotti, who some of you might, might know already. She's a, perhaps one of the most interesting photographers, um, and one that, that, that revolutionized the, the gaze that was put over the Mexican Revolution. Um, she, she photographed the, the city after the, the revolution and created a kind of aesthetic of the revolution. And she al also uh, was a model before that for her mentor um, and later colleague, Edward Weston. Um, and this is kind of the, the portrait that is given to us by Jose Vasconcelos um, of her of her body, this, he, this, this little fragment in particular refers to a very famous photograph where Tina Melody is lying down on a, on a Mexican rooftop, uh, nude, and um, with her eyes closed, that was, that was shown for the first time in, in Mexico City in the late 1920s in, Edwards, in Edward Weston's first solo show. And after that solo show, um, Diego Rivera, uh, who visited the show asked Molotti to be his, his model for several um, female figures in, in his murals. Um, so it's interesting um, how, well, you draw your own conclusion. I'm not going to come and, and preach. Um, but this is in the 1920s, right? Um, I'm going to read another tiny fragment um, that was pointed out to me by some of my students. Um, I teach a course in Mexican literature, and um, we we read we read Pedro Paramo, we read Clarice Spector, and the last the last book we read in the semester was Bolaño. And some of my female students were appalled by by this, and I was I was embarrassed because I I, I hadn't been appalled by it. Um, it was they who pointed this out. 
So this is a, just a small dialogue uh, in Savage Detectives. <clears throat> so Barrios and Raquena are speaking. They disagreed about the magazine, even though they both looked back on it with nostalgia. Are there a lot of poetesses? It's lame to call them poetesses, said Pancho. You're supposed to call them poets, said Barrios. But are there lots of them? Like never before in the history of Mexico, said Pancho. Lift a stone and you'll find a girl writing about her little life. Well, okay, you might be wondering also um, why the hell we're sitting under a lot of dirty underwear and <laughs> shirts and stuff. Um, so, some little poetesses in Mexico City uh, last year, uh, three wonderful women, Paola Abramo, eh, Citlali Rodriguez, and Marisela Guerrero, um, collected sentences addressed to their female colleagues, not necessarily poets, um, some of them artists, some of them students, um, they collected them mostly through a hashtag on Twitter, um, which was ropa sucia, meaning dirty laundry. And this hashtag kind of flooded with really dirty things. And like really, I don't know, like the, the national subconscious. <laughs> and um, once they had collected hundreds of these sentences, they, um, they, they sewed the sentences onto clothes. And they, they did a wonderful exhibition in Mexico City, much larger than this, um, with a lot more uh, clothes and, and, and other things like bar soaps, soap, bar soaps with, um, that, that show kind of graphics of the amount of, I don't know, male authors published that year versus female <laughs> authors published that year, etc. Um, so I asked them when we started putting this, this panel together, I, 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 I wrote to one of them and asked them if what had happened to the underwear. Uh, in my mind, it was all underwear, but it, it was not all the underwear. And um, uh, Paula Abramo wrote back to me saying, oh, I think it's like somewhere in this gallery in Querétaro, but I'll ask. And things came together and someone brought it to Mexico City from Querétaro and they took it to Guadalupe's house, and she nicely, very generously, accepted to bring all of this in, in her bag. We're really worried about like, what if like one of the custom officers opens her bag and all of this, in my mind it was still all underwear. I was like, okay, I just have to tell her, you changed often, I don't know, like, we'll, 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 we'll think of something. So this is how these things um, got here. Um, you're welcome to come and read when we finish read some of the sentences. I, I um, well, Lupe and I just a while ago chose some and translated them. Um, so they say things like, so you're pregnant? So much for r wanting to be a writer. Maybe your kid can be your book. Yeah, some of them are so stupid that it's like bad fiction. <laughs> if you don't have children, you'll become angry and sour. And that's what happened to that poet, look at her. <laughs> Well, this is by someone we know. <laughs> Thought, phallus, word, vagina, Octavio Paz. <laughs> I don't read women. There is not a single universal masterpiece written by a woman. Women are to blame for my lack of productivity. Con José Arreola. I'd rather you become a hooker than study literature, someone's father. Doesn't your boyfriend freak out when they invite you to poetry festivals? But make sure that when you write, no one can tell that you're a woman. It's convenient, even necessary, perhaps, to always have a na naked woman handy. Mario Benedetti. Bonsai? Is that the magazine you help your boyfriend with, right? Oh, 
Thank you. <laughs>
but all the celebrating had worn him out, and, she sp and he spent the whole night snoring. He, all he did was wedge his legs between mine. I don't know about you, but I found that description um, interesting to say the least. The verb used in Spanish was lo que él hizo fue entreverar sus piernas con las mías. And this is just at the entrance, this is at the very beginning of Pedro Paramo, right? And this is supposed to be this massive male presence right there. The second one uh, is a, a description of um, an incestuous sister who is trying to, he's, she is speaking to the same Juan Preciado character and uh, He's gone through some some tremendous dramatic events. Uh, uh, the the woman has been left has been left by now by by uh, her brother, and uh, and she's trying to engage in conversation with Juan Preciado. I went back to the room where the woman was sleeping, and I told her, "I'll stay over here in my own corner. After all, the bed's as hard as the floor. If anything happens." Let me know. This is the, the male uh, voice, Juan Preciado. Donis won't be back, she said. Uh, I saw it in his eyes. He was waiting for someone to come so he could get away. Now, you'll be the one to look after me, won't you? Don't you want to take care of me? Come, sleep here, by my side. To, to which Juan Preciado replies, I'm fine where I am. <laughs> and then she says, you, you'd be better off up here in the bed. The ticks will eat you alive down there. <laughs> I got up and I crawled in bed with her. That's from the incestuous um, uh, sister. Mm -hmm. After that event, Juan Preciado goes through another tremendous uh, dramatic scene. Uh, only to find himself um, 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 mingled together uh, within a coffin with a character whose name uh, it's going to become very important here. To me, this is a, a, a very important, perhaps the earliest queer moment in Mexican literature. And it goes like that. You are right, Doroteo. You said your name is Doroteo? And remember, these are two people speaking within a coffin. They're embracing each other, allegedly <laughs> naked, right? So you are, and you are right, Doroteo. You say your name is Dorote Doroteo, right? It doesn't matter. It's really Dorotea, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's true, Dorotea. Uh, the murmuring killed me. The, uh, there you'll find the place I love most in the world, the place where I grew thin from dreaming, my village rising from the plain, shaded with trees and leaves like a piggy bank filled with memories. You'll see why a person would want to live there forever, dawn, morning, midday, night, always the same, except for the changes in the air. The air changes the color of things there, and life whirls by as quiet as I murmur, the pure murmuring of life. Yes, Dorotea, the murmuring killed me. I was trying to hold back my fear, but it kept building until I couldn't contain it any longer. And when I was face to face, and I'll stop there. That's, uh, that's it. Dorotea and Doroteo, that's the same. But let me borrow from that energy that, and that took over the streets of Mexico City and several other cities in, uh, in the country. I was telling some younger friends here in New York last night that I felt like as though something really historic, really momentous to uh, happened last Sunday. And uh, just being able to enunciate openly uh, um, and, um, and, and pretty much for everybody, uh, all these issues related to, to, to bodies in pain and bodies who are able to enunciate themselves finally reminded me of a little piece that I, that I did based, let me see if I find that, otherwise I'll look for it and I'll read it later. Uh, I was sure I had it in here. I wanted to bring in the voice of uh, the, the voice of a woman, the voice of a woman from the countryside, the voice of a woman who, who had been, uh, who has been through a lot of uh, suffering related to the violence that is uh, 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 ravishing Mexico so profoundly. 
I can't find it right now, but I'm sure I'll find, uh, I don't want to make you guys wait, and I'll find that later on. I'll, I'll read it later. Thank you. It's a book that is about uh, perhaps the first uh, a transnational radical movement between Mexico and the United States. And it's also um, <clears throat> a work that is about uh, exile and, and revolution. And one of the things that's happening in, uh, in, in the US-Mexican borderlands around these uh, Mexican exiles and their American friends and allies in California, Arizona, Texas, um, Missouri, other, elsewhere, um, is that new kinds of families are being invented. Uh, new kinds of uh, friendships are being uh, forged. Uh, and new forms of love are also occurring. One of the things that, uh, that emerges in this book that surprised me as I was researching and writing for it um, is that there are really, I think, characteristic forms of love and betrayal and friendship that occur in this particular <coughs> movement, this uh, so-called magonismo, in the United States in, co in contrast with the Mexican Revolution and re revolutionaries in Mexico. And in order to explore all of that, uh, I, 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 uh, I crafted a, a book that, that looked at the process of revolution through friendship and betrayal uh, as a result, it's a work that has really a large number of characters in it. And what I'm going to read uh, for you is just a snippet um, talking about one of these characters, a woman named uh, Elizabeth uh, Trowbridge. <clears throat> the other high class Easterner in the Noel Conspiratorial Salon was Elizabeth Darling Trowbridge, a Boston heiress who had studied English at Radcliffe. Elizabeth had joined the Socialist Party at 18. She came to Los Angeles early in 1908 with her mother, the redoubtable Mrs. Schultes. She was 29 years old then. Through socialite friends in Santa Barbara, Elizabeth contacted the Knowles, who combined respectability, P.D. Knoll worked in finance, with strong socialist commitments. Frances Naki Knoll was active as an organizer and as a writer both in the union movement and for women's suffrage, a cause that would finally pass the ballot in California in 1910. Her husband always went by the highfalutin acronym PD, but not so much because he was a power-mongering, cigar-puffing financier, as because his given name was Primrose. So Ethel once wryly remarked, quote, who could blame him? <laughs> I'm skip skipping a bit. Um, like other unconventional women in that sort of society, Elizabeth was confined to home for her rebellious acts. This is back in Boston. Um, her health began to decline as a result, and she was taken to Europe on the well-trodden European tour to make elite women forget and to rebuild strained social ties. That was a familial strategy often discussed in American literature of the era. Henry James, Edith Wharton, and others wrote works where the European tour was so employed, whisking away a rich but scandalous woman for the re relief of the family and with hope of reform. And indeed, it was this that confronted Elizabeth, except that unlike the characters in James and Wharton's novels, Elizabeth's scandal stemmed from her social convictions rather than from rumors of a disadvantageous romantic attachment. That would come later. Upon her return from Europe, Elizabeth's health was still faltering, so Mrs. Schultes took her to California, hoping to effect a cure. But I believe that Elizabeth's mother was exasperated by her daughter, so by the time they reached California, the lady accepted Elizabeth's excuse regarding the benefits of the local climate and left her in the care of the Knowles, who, though respectable, 
were the, nonetheless known socialists. It seems possible that Mrs. Schultz was relieved by the prospect of leaving her daughter far from Boston and in a place where she herself might be perceived as having discharged her duties as a mother, given the healthy benefit of the California weather. That, however, is speculation. What we know is that the lady left Elizabeth in Los Angeles, much to that girl's relief. As soon as she was on her own, Elizabeth transferred her entire trust fund to P.D. Noble's bank and threw herself and her money into her new found passion, the Mexican cause. The girl had the financial resources to make a difference in the cause, and she was more than willing to use them. Elizabeth's education, age, marital status, character, independence, and money put her in a position of some ascendancy. At first, Ethel recalled, Elizabeth was shyly in the background, but she had taken fire, and before long, she was leading all of us, except perhaps Harriman, who was later a candidate for mayor of Los Angeles. Um, um, even the incandescent John Murray, always ready to do battle for the downtrodden, learned to defer to her when she set her stubborn chin. Why was Elizabeth so drawn to the Mexican cause? This question has at times been badly mangled. Thus, historian Lowell Blaisdell has characterized the American supporters of the Mexican Liberal Party in the following terms, quote, in addition to the usual radicals, there were a number of prosperous American donors such as people misled by the innocuous sounding name of the party, the Mexican Liberal Party, these were anarchists, um, <clears throat> ardent sympathizers of obvious underdogs and cloistered radicals, some of whom were well-educated but maladjusted women, close quote. Certainly Elizabeth, who was the Liberal's biggest donor in 1908 and 1909, was both well-educated and maladjusted, at least with regard to her natal family but her support for the Mexican liberals was not the rational act of an isolated hysteric, as Blaisdell implies. Though eccentric, Elizabeth's commitments had social roots. They were shared by an identifiable current. In addition to the com prisoner's compelling character, the liberals' denunciation of Mexican slavery was a strong factor of attraction for the three women who were at the core of the American group. Certainly, the connection between slave emancipation and feminine uh, politicization was a central tenet for the Bostonian Elizabeth Crowbridge, convinced of the need to seek a deeper, unified meaning to life than what was upheld in dominant conventions. Elizabeth had earlier refused to be a member of the Church of England and cultivated a friendship with theosophist Evangeline Adams instead. The esoteric teachings of theosophy were founded in the conviction that the universe as a whole was, has a ciphered but coherent meaning and purpose. And indeed, Elizabeth was committed to the exploration of a panoply of interconnected philosophies concerned with human morality and freedom. Thus, in addition to being a theosophist, she was a socialist, a feminist, a defender of animals, a vegetarian, and an even an amateur astrologist. Such combinations were not unusual for the progressives of her generation. Indeed, the connection between the American feminist tradition and the fight against slavery in the Mexican cause was anything but random or fortuitous. There was a deep historical connection between feminism and emancipation from Harriet Beecher Stowe, Lucy Stone, and Susan B. Anthony forward. It is thus no coincidence that when Ricardo Flores Magón was in Leavenworth Penitentiary, where he died, one of the people who regularly inquired after him was Lucy Stone's daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell, an editor, author, and suffragist who despite never having met Ricardo, supported his release and made special inquiries to the prison physician on his behalf. I quote, I'm interested in Ricardo Flores Magón, who's in prison under the Espionage Act, she wrote. A friend of his in New York tells me his health is, in serious, is seriously broken. Will you kindly tell me just what the state of his health is and much oblige Miss Alice Stone Blackwell? Moreover, Although Elizabeth's diet of reading and her concerns may not have found much reinforcement in Radcliffe's curriculum, the college was conservative in its approach to what constituted suitable reading for young ladies. Students were open to America's women writers, and the overall environment at Harvard was by no means devoid of radicals. Thus, just a few years after Elizabeth studied there, John Reed also majored in English and got involved in the Mexican Revolution, although albeit a little later, in 1914. 
Reed went on famously to join the Russian Revolution and was a founder of the American Communist Party. To my knowledge, no one has ever called Reed a maladjusted, overeducated hysteric. <laughs> Elizabeth Trowbridge des deserves the same courtesy. Moreover, the constellation of concerns that brought Elizabeth to the Mexican cause applied just as powerfully to Francis Nacky Noel and to Ethel Duffy Turner. They were, in short, part of an identifiable trend. I'm very happy to be in the table with these colleagues I admire. Uh, nevertheless, I feel very uncomfortable to be put in a table of women. It's like I feel like an insect. And they never do a table of men. So I'm very happy Claudio joins us. <laughs> it attenuates the blow. So I prepared, nevertheless, I love to write about women. And I prepared a text on some Mexican women. Susana Chavez was born on November 4, 1974, in Ciudad Juarez, in the North Mexican state of Chihuahua. She began to write at the age of 11. She became a poet and a blogger, and attended university where she studied psychology. She also directed some short films and served as a model for the movie poster advertising 16 on the List, a 1998 film based on the murders of women in Ciudad Juarez. Not that she was a model, but she had friends in the movie world and it happened. In the first half of the, 20, uh, the 2000s, Susana wrote a good number of poems and was quite active in the literary scene of Chihuahua. Susana Chavez also became an activist. She regularly joined demonstrations demanding an end to femicides in Ciudad Juarez. As you perhaps know, the inspiration for Roberto Bolaño's posthumous novel, 2666, was Sergio Gonzalez Rodriguez's 2002 book on the murdered women of Juarez, Huesos en el Desierto, Bones in the Desert. I can well imagine Sergio Gonzalez Rodriguez meeting those years Susana Chavez at one of the early Ciudad Juarez demonstrations, talking to her, maybe sharing a beer or 12. <laughs> Chavez coined the phrase, ni una más, not one more, which became the slogan and name of the social justice movement, ni una más. She helped raise international awareness about the women in Juarez whose tortured bodies were dumped in the desert. A parenthesis. In crafting a rallying cry, Susana Chavez was making in the footsteps of another woman writer that I adore, Dolores Jimenez Imuro. A century before, during the Mexican Revolution, Dolores Jimenez Imuro coined the slogan, La tierra es de quien la trabaja. The land belongs to those who work it with their hands. The phrase usually gets attributed to Zapata or other men, but it was hers. She was then a well-known journalist and poet, and she became a coronel in the Revolutionary Army. She is the only woman in the iconic photograph taken when Francisco Villa and Emiliano Zapata posed in the presidential chair in Mexico City. Jose Revueltas, a first-class Mexican author, wrote and published a script called Zapata, where he argues that the revolutionary hero was in love with Dolores Jimenez y Muro. A preposterous notion. My grandmother would say, one can never trust men. Even when they praise a woman, they diminish her value, as is the case of making Dolores Jimenez y Muro 
the protagonist of a love affair rather than a comrade in arms. End of parenthesis. In 2004, the same year Roberto Bolaño 2666 appeared, Susana Chavez published him to a city in the desert. In her prologue, she explains its goal. This book represents a cry of fire from the heart of poetry against the violence that takes many forms. Among them, the most unspeakable, the murder of hundreds of women. One of her poems talks about the murdered women of Juarez. I'm going to read it in English. I couldn't find the credit of the translator, which I find very badly. I found it in the web. It's published in the web of the English pen page. Our blood. Blood of my own. Blood of sunrise. Blood of a broken moon. Blood of silence. Of dead rock of a woman in bed jumping into nothingness, open to the madness, both clear and definite, fertile sea, blood the unbelievable journey, blood as its own liberation, blood, river of my songs, blood, painful moment of my birth, nourished by my last appearance. In another of her poems, Chavez says that ghosts sob, fantasmas sollozan. I have no doubt that ghosts sob in Chihuahua, her birthplace. Chihuahua desert hides the bones of hundreds and hundreds of murdered women and men, both Mexicans and migrants. Texas, into which Chihuahua desert extends, as well as other frontier American states should also acknowledge the sobbing of their ghosts. One of these ghosts was a 50-year-old nurse turned activist named Maricela Escobedo. In December 2010, in the capital of Chihuahua, she was assassinated while standing precisely one step away from the doors of the governor's palace under the gaze of its surveillance cameras. She was not a poet, but a 21st century Antigone demanding justice. Her daughter, Ruby, a teenager and already a mother, had been murdered. Maricela Escobedo wanted to give her a proper burial, but Ruby had disappeared. Maricela searched and searched until she found Ruby's body, not in the desert, but half hidden in a pigsty on the outskirts of the city, the body of her 16-year-old daughter, semi-devoured by rats. After Ruby's funeral, Maricela fought to bring her killer to justice. There's no space here to describe the steps she took nor to wonder at her tenacity. She traced him down. He was jailed and confessed. He even begged Maricela and her family to pardon him. Nevertheless, being a minor member of a powerful criminal organization, the killer was set free by a corrupt judge. Maricela fiercely continued her fight. The case was reopened. When the confessed assassin was about to be rearrested, he escaped. Maricela camped out in front of the governor's palace demanding justice. She received a bullet in her head. On the 5th of January 2011, only weeks after Maricela Escobedo was shot, Susana Chavez went out to visit some friends. She never arrived. She had become una más, one more. Susana's bones were not in the desert. They found her body a few days after her death, a few blocks away from her home. They had cut off her hand. 
Why? This atrocity has to be understood in a larger context. That same year, in the neighboring state of Tamaulipas, newspapers have been terrorized into stopping the reports on drug dealers' outrages. Maria Elizabeth Macias Castro, a brave and well-known editor at the New Nuevo Laredo newspaper, circumvented this press blackout by blogging about organized crime activities in the region. Several days later, her body was found next to her severe head and hands and a computer keyboard or two, I think, along with a note signed with the letters Z, the Z, like the Zetas, we don't know if they were there, that read, I am here because of my reports. Susana Chavez, Dolores Jimenez y Muro, Maricela Escobedo, Maria Elizabeth Maria Castro, not great writers like Olayo or Octavio Paz, pretty much unknown or forgotten or ignored, but powerful voices from the women of Mexico. Thank you. Her slender body was covered with layers of cotton underpants she used as an emotional shield. Her keepers had bleached her short, curly hair, and her pale, almost translucent skin betrayed someone who had stopped eating in order to stop growing. She, like some of the other girls that had been sexually exploited for tourists and abused for child pornography films, did not want to grow breasts. They refused to become women, to be sexualized. They did not want to be, to be desired because desire has already turned them into slaves. That particular girl had maple brown eyes that betrayed the sadness I had only seen before in another woman who had lost her child to serial killing of women in northern Mexico. She talked staring at me, searching for an adult to trust. All of a sudden, she squeezed my hand harder with her bony fingers, her voice regaining strength. Livia, if you promise not to abandon us, I will tell you everything. I had been a reporter for 18 years and had never encountered such a powerful group of survivors as I did that day, in spite of most horrific crimes they had endured. Yet all they wanted for me, from me was to grant them the right to be believed, to be listened to, and to seek justice. They had gone to hell and back, and they knew that they had the right to expose the crimes perpetrated against them and other girls. With baffling empathy, they demanded the traffickers be stopped so no other girl would ever suffer as they had. Meeting them changed my life forever. Not only because as soon as I started writing about the perpetrators in the media, I received serious death threats, but also because even in the darkest of time, despite the nightmares and the mood swings, what they most fervently asked for was justice. They asked that 
I would try my best to ensure the abusers and their accomplices would not rape or sell another girl as long as they live, as they were alive. This is the power I'm referring to, the ability to fight for others even when you have every reason to give up on humanity. Being an effective reporter entails investigating the truth and never dismissing the human side of those trusting you with their story. But that day, these girls taught me another lesson. However brutal life had been for them, they refused to normalize violence with, when violence had been the norm in their lives. They knew what was just and what wasn't. The innate dignity they had managed to retain brought me humility. We now have many examples of girls who survived sexual crimes and did not keep silent as their grandmothers had. Once they have the right network supporting them, usually other women, they're able to act upon their anger. They acknowledge the rights to be protected and to lead a free life. From an 11-year-old Afghan girl that rebels against child marriage to a 12-year-old Mexican that <coughs> flees from a pink pink father, we're seeing how girls are challenging the culture that surrounds them, a culture that often normalizes inequality and results in extreme forms of violence, including rape. Meanwhile, in developed countries, girl, girls are being bombarded with old-fashioned stereotypes, portraying them as objects with a modern fear of hypersexualized porn from femininity. In both instances, women are being victimized, but the latter is more treacherous, triggering guilt as women and girls believe they deserve to be mistreated or belittled because they agreed to the fantasy world in order to be accepted and desired. It is time for girls everywhere to join hands. We must open the floor to dialogue. We must listen to their voices, allow them to meet and understand each other. There are still mainstream voices telling girls to be compliant, to accept the old rules and play by them. But we are also witnessing tremendous change led by individual girls that are creating their own revolution based on the idea that nobody deserves to be mistreated in exchange for law money or acceptance. These girls need new role models and are creating their own. We must help them create a new narrative, a storyline in which all forms of violence have been edited out. We must let them know they are too the utopia their grandmothers dreamt about when they were little. I am grateful for my own legacy of strong women and to all the girls who have helped me develop and sharpen the sense of justice and dignity that makes me feel I too deserve to be called a woman. translated by Jen Hoffer, um, LA-based poet. It is uh, this poem I um, organized, developed with the words of Luz Maria Davila, a woman who lived in uh, Ix, in Ciudad Juarez. Uh, I was reading um, what another very courageous and very brave journalist wrote about her, Sandra Rodriguez. And when I read these words, I was convinced that I didn't I didn't need to do anything to these words, that they were powerful enough in and of themselves. And that my task as a writer in this case was just to put them together, to, to put them in contact with perhaps other words, and, uh, and to perhaps be able to, to build a forum where these words could echo with our own experience now. The title in Spanish is La Reclamante, uh, Jen Hopper has translated this as the claimant. Pardon me, Mr. President, but I will not offer you my hand. 
You are not my friend. I cannot welcome you. You are not welcome. No one is. Luz Maria Dávila, Villas de Salvarcar, mother of Marcos and Jose Luis Piña Dávila, 19 and 17 years old. It is not fair. My boys were at a party and they were killed. Massacre on Saturday, January 30th in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, 15 death. Because here in Ciudad Juarez, put yourself in my place. Villas de Salvarcar, my back, my fulminous paradox. For two years now, murders have been committed. Many crimes are being committed. To commit is a glittering birth, a radium verticum, a lethargic tremor. Many crimes are being committed and nobody does anything. And I only want justice to be done and not only to my two children. The dead, anguished, the fulminous massacred, the glittering lost. But for everyone, justice. To confront, to secure, to claim, to throw it in his face, to demand, to exact, to require, to vindicate. Don't tell me, of course, do something. If someone had, had killed your child, you could look for the murderer under every stone, under every stone, under a stone, under. But since I don't have the resources, alms for the birds, my bones, my flesh, of your flesh, my flesh, put yourself in my plates, put yourself my shoes, my fingernails, my stellar shiver. I can't look for them because I don't have resources. I have my two sons' death. Be actor, burial in the open sky, which literally means to give alms to the birds. I have my bag, my tear, my hammer. I don't have justice. Put yourself in their place, be as a salvarca, there where they killed my two sons. You are not my friend, this is the hand I do not offer you. Put yourself, Mr. President, in their place. I give you my back, my thirst. I give you my shiver. Unknown, my anguished tenderness, my glittering birds, my death. And the very small woman in the blue sweater left the room, wiping her tears. Thank you. father, a scholar, and a writer. I think we've run out of time, unfortunately, and we would really like to take questions from you. So we'll open a Q&A session with the audience. Maybe while you make up your minds as to what you'd like to ask. Any of you who has questions for another panelist, maybe? Let's start with that. OK, I have a question like that. Um, so a lot of. Um, what you have presented to us tonight are um, realities in Mexico and in other places, by the way. It's, Mexico's not unique to these issues. Um, but the story in the news is uh, that has been going on in Mexico for, I would say, two years now, is of the students who um, were crazily murdered, actually. And Peña Nieto's government's non-reaction to it, and you just read this poem from this mother. So I'm wondering, as writers, do you feel responsibility to, to work in fiction or poetry with this particular issue? And um, if not, why? And if, if so, why? Yeah, I 
<laughs> well, I, I have been working very closely trying to understand what is happening in my country. I've been uh, trying to work as uh, carefully as I can with, uh, with language and events. Um, my idea of, of writing is one that is conducive to critical thinking, to, to subverting the existing hierarchies of power involving both gender, class, and race, and everything else. I, I felt the need to write about this. I did that in my own way. Um, I, I, I couldn't write fiction. I couldn't write um, anything autobiographical. I, my way of responding to this was to pay close attention to the words that were already there in the public arena, uh, the words that I was listening to, and I tried to touch them as little as I could. I, was, I saw myself as someone able to, to pick them, to select them, and perhaps recontextualize them uh, in, in order to, 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 to share them, but also to to do something that I, I think writing is capable of, which is creating community. So um, that's, uh, I haven't written, after that I, I wrote a book in, in 2011, uh, dealing with issues of pain and violence. It was a cross-genre work involving poetry, documentary poetry, as well as I shared with you, uh, some essays, um, some chronicles as well. And then after that, I have refrained myself of, of writing uh, about um, the, 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 the unfolding tragedy in which Mexico has become, uh, which doesn't mean that I haven't quit paying attention, which doesn't mean that I have a quit pain feeling, uh, very frustrated at times. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to mention the demonstration that took place la last Sunday. I, I just, I truly believe that something very important happened. I, I cannot foresee exactly what the consequences of this is going to be, but I speak with these friends, I speak, I speak with my family members, and I, I, I sense that we've been able to accomplish something that is really important, in, in, which is enunciating openly something that has been just so, so covered by, by a by normalization of violence, among many other things, by the hierarchy of power, etc. So um, I, I just would like to end this intervention, intervention right now by saying that like, something important happened. Women took to the streets. We are engaging in a larger discussion, in a very important, very complex discussion about, about pain, about suffering, but also about what is next. Uh, for me, it's become an obsession. Uh, and a load in my life, it's changed my life. Uh, the first thing I did was write a book of poems, a Padre Insomnio, Insomni, uh, about the, the bloodshed of the damn war against drugs, if we can call it that. And then I could read again, and I got very obsessed by the theme, and I engaged my, my husband, who is a historian, to write together a book to try to understand from a historical perspective. And we wrote Narco History, um, how Mexico and the USA together have created the war against drugs. Then I again could read a bit, I wrote uh, another book of poems that I will publish in, in the house of where I started publishing, and Bolaño and all those poetesses that, by the way, were much superior to the poetos. Veronica Volkov, Gloria Gerbitz. It was a generation of women authors. It was a wonderful, extraordinary generation of young talent. We were all young. We were publishing very good poems. Uh, and I gave him my my book uh, that it's a uh, 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 poem, so we can call it that, on precisely the 43. Uh, and then I, being obsessed by the theme, I wrote another novel in between that has nothing to do with that. I could breathe and go back to fiction. fiction. Uh, the novel that appeared this June in Mexico. And then I returned again to the theme and I've written a long book on the Antigones in Mexico. Um, well, but long, it's not long. I started with a lecture I gave at Berkeley and I kept uh, uh, 
observing it and it's for me an obsession. And what has been more difficult in the middle of all this is to leave. It's an incredible sorrow. It's, a, it's changed my life. It's changed my appetite of life. Um, just because really I am nothing but a writer, I continue writing. But all my own self, there's uh, uh, the blood, it's been too much. It's 26,000 disappeared, accepted by the government. So how many more? I mean, it's, uh, it's difficult to sleep, it's difficult to breathe. Uh, and I write because it's, I've, I've written all my life as a survival and as a way of living and, and I continue writing. But uh, I, your question is like something I've asked myself every damn day. <laughs> uh, I don't write, I die. But can I live with this? I don't know. Really, it's too horrible. Um, not the 43, the 20, yes, the 43 plus, the 26,000 or who knows how many disappeared, plus all the pain, plus how it has damaged their country. And just for this idiotic idea, and now of course it, the reversal would be difficult, but this idiotic idea that was threaded in this beautiful country that drugs should be become, using drugs should become a crime. And they don't think of the real drugs, the real drugs, the psychoactives, sugar, <laughs> coffee, <laughs> wine. I am a drug user. I only use legals on luckily. Those are the ones I like. Um, I would love to enjoy others, but I don't have that desire or that. Nevertheless, it's so horrible. This, this has been so horrible. And it is a core responsibility. It's not a Mexican inertia. That is super important to understand. Uh, and well, thanks again to my beautiful husband who, <laughs> who wrote with me that book and helped me. Because honestly, if we hadn't written together that book, I wouldn't be here with you today. Interject, I would just like to hear from both of you because you're, you're very active fiction writers and you haven't overtly broached any of those topics. So I wonder if you could make a case or talk to us about the battle that maybe goes on in your head in terms of. Yeah, it, it, is, it is, as you define it, a, a battle. Um, I, contrary to, to what Carmen was, was <coughs> telling uh, just now, her own experience. Um, I completely shut up my, my fiction to the noise outside in the news, or what I perceived as noise, I mean, what I, what I read and experienced as, as, a, as a kind of crumbling of my country. But I was also, um, I reacted very violently to that by sh shutting the doors completely. And in the first novel that I wrote, I mean, I haven't been writing as long as, as Catherine and I, I don't have as, as many great books as she has written, but the first novel that I wrote uh, just uh, some years ago, I guess, I, um, I, if I remember correctly, the only reference to, to what's going on outside in Mexico, so-called outside, is, um, is something that, that, that someone hears in the radio, and it's just one sentence, and then the person shuts the, the window, it's like a radio outside, and then you can't hear it anymore. Um, and I was very, I was very active in my defense of space of fiction against this noise from outside. Um, I thought it was really necessary to preserve some sanity and some some health. That doesn't mean that I ignored any any of it, and that I didn't see it uh, and worry about it. Um, and although I was a kind of activist of not in fiction, not here, I, 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 I also felt that a lot of people in my generation were, were kind of using this the, sort of this crumbling nation as, as material for fiction, uh, 
in, in a way that was a bit parasitical. Uh, I, I'm not saying that it was necessarily the, the case, but that, that was my feeling, especially with my, my own generation that was starting to, to write. And um, so I never did. And just more recently, um, I, I write in Spanish, although I, I grew up bilingual, and, or at least I've written my first three books in Spanish. And more recently, I've been writing a book, in a novel in English, and also for the first time, started writing in the third person. All my books are written in the first person. And so I wrote in English, and maybe English allowed me like, to take one step further and further from myself, perhaps, and started writing in the third person, not only in English. And as soon as I started writing in the third person and in English, what I started writing without really planning it was, um, a story about, about seven migrant children moving up uh, through the Mexican desert. Um, so now I am contradicting like, my, <laughs> my own desire for many years, and, and I, I have to write what I'm writing. I, I could not write anything different. Uh, but I had to wait all these years and use another language and switch a narrative person <laughs> in order to write about what I wanted to write. A little, little bit like Valeria, because I never supported engaged literature. I don't think that literature should serve anything but literature. And <clears throat> I was okay with the people that used it to express what they were feeling. If your goats tell tell you that you should write about violence, go go. On. But uh, my goats weren't telling me to write about violence. And now, <laughs> unfortunately, this situation is s uh, so desperate that even my, my goats <laughs> are telling me to write. You're not uh -huh. engaged, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's not about what's happening outside or in the borderline or situations that I don't know exactly. But most, I've realized that all this violence that we're talking about come within the families, inside the families, mm -hmm. because it has to come from somewhere. And the source of it is exactly family um, dynamics, the violence between our parents, and mm -hmm. parents against or with children, and that's the violence that I'm talking about in this <coughs> new book, that I, know, I don't know at all what is going to. <laughs> Another question? Hi, I subscribe to the uh, Letras Libre uh, blog, and uh, right after the, um, it came out in the news that the international com um, organization that was um, uh, investigating the, the murder of the 43 students, um, um, came out in the newspapers in the United States, um, I then on Sunday, which is when the blog comes out, um, I expected it that it was going to be the front, you know, that that, it, that edition was going to be dedicated to that or at least have something on it. And I was really surprised that there was absolutely nothing on it in the magazine. And I've uh, heard that um, <laughs> that the government has had a lot of pressure on writers and the, the media not to publish or not to write about the 43 students. And I'm wondering whether, uh, as writers, is, is that true? Do you know? Um, well, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't find anything in Letras Libres in particular. <laughs> um, but maybe someone has something less poisonous to say. <laughs> maybe the historian. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I haven't seen the blog, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't think that there's uh, pressure against writing uh, about this coming from the government, at least in my experience. What there is is a, a lot of noise that comes in part financed by various kinds of people one doesn't know necessarily by whom, and in, in the case in partic uh, particularly of this, of this report, um, it, it takes some work, probably, to, to begin to react unless you're really into it. 625 pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, 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 might, it might be 
they might you, you might expect a reaction. I would think that it might take a, a little bit longer, be just simply because the the investigation, like this investigation, um, is such a total mess, right? And that's what's been revealed in this uh, in, in this new report. Uh, what's obvious is that you can't you we don't know what in what in the world to believe or what not because they, they came out with a, a you know the report says that a number of the witnesses were tortured, I mean, not a small number, whatever, 17 of them, uh, that they that they document, uh, plus uh, you know, the whole investigation of watched, which is not news in Mexico, because a lot of the high-profile investigations before were partly staged, like if, if it most famously the case of Florence Cassese's investigation, which was totally doctored for the media. So as a result, even just sifting through this stuff requires certain amount of savvy, and uh, not all the writers are that savvy in that, and the, most of the people I, I think who are doing the better analysis tend to be uh, journalists who are more experienced in that, or some of them who are closer to the legal apparatus. So places like Le 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 I mean, in part, I think Valeria's comment refers to perhaps, you know, who knows what their take will be once they have one. Um, but even having a take, given how garbled these judicial investigations are in Mexico and the difficulty of credibility all the way down the line, it, it makes it hard to, to react in a, in a meaningful way, I think. But I think it's important to point out that a lot of journalists have been actually persecuted for murder, especially not in Mexico City outside, Veracruz, the last two years, more than 17 have been murdered. So, of course, there is pressure from the government. And there is a lot of impunity of all these people that pay for the murders and then are still in the power places. I want to say something of the youngest participants of this table. Uh, when they invited us, I immediately started catching wonderful women artists and writers of which I would have loved to share their stories with you. Uh, so I had even picked one that I wanted to talk about and I was going to show you images from Medias Battle that I adore. But it was difficult to choose one. There are wonderful women artists, wonderful women writers all throughout our history. The first name writer of Mexico was a woman Juana Inés de la Cruz, she invented the idea of Mexico. I mean, it's many, there are many. Uh, but, uh, and I had even provided a draft with the number of pages they had told me, uh, words I, I, I needed to talk about to Monica, thinking I was the last one. And then they all started writing that they were going to bring panties. We were <laughs> promised panties. <laughs> Embroidered panties and that they wanted, so they, they forced me to switch the tone and it took me a lot of time because I love fiction and I love art. And I, I went from, okay, then Rosario Castellanos, okay, then Arreola, then I even brought the things I had thought of, found of Arreola, full of joy and fun. But the younger ones pushed me again to a territory I always want to, uh, I mean, I would have loved to have used this uh, moments or this time just to praise the wonderful, extraordinary, first class women writers and, and, and artists and musicians and scientists that have populated wonderful Mexico. Do you have a question? I think Carmen answered it. It was a defense of, of a table with women and, and one man, but because uh, because women are not at all at the tables, and because the cumulative your cumulative voices and your choices of to reflecting women through through other people's voices has been so rich and has um, I think created a concentrated effect that perhaps if you had just been the women at other tables would have happened. So I'm, I'm very grateful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I enjoyed what I heard tonight, but I'm a little bit confused. If this had been a table of American 
women writing for the New Yorker, how would their experience be and their work be different than what you produce in Mexico? <laughs> I think, you know, I think you, you know the answer to the question better than we do. <laughs> I know the American mm. like this. I don't know much about the Mexicans. Perhaps there's less of an urgency, although there actually is a very important movement started by women. It's called VIDA, V-I-D-A, actually it's a the word of Spanish, VIDA. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, they've been doing these very thorough counts, comparing how many male, get, how many male authors get published in journals and newspapers and publishers, and, uh, and how many women do. And they've been doing this for like five years, and it's grown exponentially. And they are so, I have to say, relentless in their approach, but they've actually managed to remind us all that the issue is not over. So you can choose not to ignore that, right? I mean, one thing to say about Letras Libres is that no one bats, I, I think people do bat an eye, but it's not a surprise if you get an issue of Letras Libres and 95 of the contributors are male. It's just a non-issue. It's not the only magazine. Exactly. Most magazines. Yeah. And exactly. also as a woman writer, you have to achieve five pens, uh, ten times more just to be fairly respected. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a load in life. That's something. And I think that I don't know, uh, this doesn't happen in, in the US, it does in Mexico. In, in, in the Mexican imaginary, uh, fame is something that's really bad. Like if you if you're famous as a writer, it's because you're a sellout mm -hmm. and you write you write bad fiction, um, and so is it like money. You know, it's like it, it's this very Catholic thing of uh, no, like you, to be a writer you have to be poor, remain poor, and um, not sell books and not be famous at all ever. Um, <laughs> and then you get then you get prestige, then you get prestige, which is much better, right? And I think that I mean, I mean better in, in, in this sort of definition of, of, of things. Um, and I think that a Mexican woman writer will never be able to uh, enjoy prestige. It's just something not, not conceded to female writers. If a, a, a woman writer does very well. Uh, of, I think it was different before the bestsellers, the women bestsellers published I'm sure, I'm in sure Mexico because yeah. in my generation, <coughs> being a woman writer, was before the bestseller era, mm -hmm. was the prestige. Yeah. I'm not joking. I mean, and there was, Octavio Paz looked at us girls <laughs> with absolute admiration, and we were considered very highly. It was not a bonus, but there was a desire till several bestsellers written by women uh, appeared. Uh, and then, when we were no longer an exception, uh, when really the book stands were packed with books of women, then we, ooh! <laughs> the I mean, what I... About, who did that? What happened? Like how... The how best sellers, the best sellers, the factor of yes. envy. I don't know if you have heard of that beautiful word. I think it's the factor of envy, but also the, the, the abundance of extraordinary women writers in Mexico. And that was difficult. It's, very, it's one thing that you have one or two or three, and then you have a bunch that's too much. <laughs> uh, that they could swallow it. And that bunch of girls sell more books than girls, and then Laura Esquivel publishes her bestseller, and Nathalie Mastretta publishes her bestseller, etc. And that made the thing, everything change. I mean, I have other view because I'm old. Not because being young is very difficult. It's the same. It's the same. Uh, so <laughs> it, it's a, it, it really, it, I mean, I, I, re, I published my, my, my first real novel because the very earlier one, Me Cortes Aparecis, in the house of publishing of, of Octavio Paz. And they gave me the main literary prize of Mexico. And I was very young. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was an 
Uh, it was, an, mm, everybody wrote reviews and they treated women with respect. But when the bestsellers appeared, then uh, all the sensibility towards women writers changed. And I think it's good we talk about it. I never say it publicly because I, I don't want to, to look like I am saying, pinches macho. <laughs> <laughs> no, but definitely, it takes it takes a, con a concerted effort just to, to hide the abundance of, of, of good women writers. And and I totally agree with you, Carmen, that something happened once women's books became so so available, and, and when everybody agreed that they were good, that they touched upon so many issues of life, that there was not one single female way of writing books, that the range of experimentation and exploration was, was wide and interesting. And so, so we see that. Those of us who read because of the quality of the books, not because of gender, and I mean those of us who read both men and women, and not only men, uh, we know that. And it takes a lot of effort, a lot of social effort, just to keep everything quiet, just to keep that in the, in the, in the dark. And so I'm very glad that we're, as you are, I'm very glad we're speaking about it right now, especially after Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just want to add something in terms of uh, genre, because uh, you mentioned before poets. The poets of your generation, the best poets by far, are all women. Who are the men of your generation who are writing the poetry that well, younger generations. Well, Rosalind Rivas is a very good poet. I do, yeah, no, I do no, no. have okay. several ones. Okay. I, I am <laughs> not sexist. No, I'm not sexist either, but, but I have to say it's a the, yes. the best, the best are us women. I mean, I really. Yes. <laughs> well, okay, let's not uh, say that's best why or some worst. people don't like me. I say the, 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 the reality, the reality is the best yes. are women. No, I don't think, I think the worst are men. Well, I don't, want to, I don't want to say best or worst, but I will say, as someone who's not too much younger than you, but a little, some, I'm younger, I'm a different generation, I'm kind of in between, we're placed kind of chronologically. Maybe. So, someone in between the, 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 the people who formed me as a writer and my sensibility as a poet were not, I mean, Octavio Paz was, yes, of course, he's, he's a poet you read. It was inevitable, right? It was inevitable, just like. Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, pollution was another <laughs> I'm not saying it was polluting animals, I'm just saying it was, no, in fact, it was a gateway drug. It was amazing to have had Octavio Paz's uh, poetry around as a very young, avid poetry reader. But the, the people really left a mark because they conveyed that everything was possible were the women. And it was you. Cora Brancho, Maria Baranda, Teddy Lopez Mills, Veronica Volko, Gloria Gervitz, Pura Lopez Colomé. I mean, the list is endless. So, so I really, I don't know. I mean, I think to me, they always, their writing always was incredibly prestigious, whatever that was. So my, you know, and, and maybe, maybe it's also a, a, another Catholic thing. Poetry is always unpolluted, right? To use that word again, because it's not dirty by money. That, that equation, commercialism, is not part of it. But I, I, I might also think that the bestseller thing was attributed to the co-option of what was valuable about feminine writing. There was such a thing, that thing that was different from males because it was, again, open, not patriarchal, everything was possible, the, 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 the mo there were no grand narratives, et cetera. All those things become co-opted and then they end up working for the market in the form of women's best sellers. Mm -hmm. right? You have a hand over there. I was just wondering uh, what uh, you see your role, how, how your role is different, or how you see your role as different from male writers of, Me of Mexico, and how you see like patriarchy in that conversation. Like, are you including like gay? writers, gay Latin writers in this midst of Latina, or, or how is that separate and how can it be more inclusive in the conversation? Because you're mentioning Octavio Paz, who is like patriarchy at his finest. And so, but you're mentioning it in a context of hierarchy and how 
that is what you looked up to, but how do we break away from that conversation mm -hmm. and to be more inclusive and mm -hmm. well, Latino, Latino writers? And how is it different from that of mm -hmm. male writers and patriarchs? In this day and age. Mm -hmm. When I was young, I only worked with women, and mainly all of them were gay. Uh, and I was like them, and I don't really, and I also have very close male friends, and I really don't know what I am. I mean, I don't put myself under a label. And I think that's the uncomfortable thing, I think, for many of us in the table, because we, we don't, it's, we don't do the American, maybe, maybe Christina has another take, but I, I refuse the labels. I, I, I am not, I am, I am a, a right? I don't know. Well, <laughs> let me say, uh, 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 well, my perspective on it, I, I see myself as a writer, of course, and I, I, I'm very interested in bodies, in life. I'm interested in what bodies do in relation to each other. I, I like how they resist each other, how they attract each other. I'm, I'm interested in that complexity. And so if I'm writing a story, I will take uh, my story wherever, I mean, I will follow my story. And if, if that matter is, is uh, it requires a variety of elements, I, I try to be as, as, um, as faithful to, to my own exploration as I can. Um, so I'm not uh, I'm not working with this idea that I have to fulfill I have to have certain percentage of characters or I have to to fulfill some um, uh, parameters external to, to the work that I'm doing. Now I do consider that, that this is an exploration that to me it's an exploration that it is is aesthetic but it's also political and it's also ethical. I don't see a difference between these these three these three elements. And, and I think in that sense, to me, that's what writers do. Uh, that's, that we are trying to, to build worlds, and, and, and some of us are more interested in bodies than others. Some of us are interested in issues of pain, death, love. Uh, in many ways, all these elements are, are the, the, the great topics of all times. And, and what I see myself doing is, is uh, enunciating those, those topics, those great issues, in, in my contemporary language in the languages that I, that I come uh, into, that I run into, that I work with. So, so um, I'm a writer of many interests in that, in that sense, and, and, uh, and, I, and I try to touch the matter that, that concerns me, that I'm obsessed by and fascinated by, with as many tools as I have at hand, with this very humble and this very powerful tool that language is. I, I really agree with that viewpoint. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't feel that as a writer, I play any role. Um, the only, the only thing I do is sit behind my words and, and doubt at each of them. <laughs> and um, I, I, when you write, you, you know, I mean, here we're standing in, in a kind of podium and we're, we're speaking to an audience. But when you're writing, you're not in, in the position of speaking from a podium. You're, you're full of security and doubt and complexity and ambivalence and I think that that's what is and should be translated to the page. No um, um, pamphletary positions, uh, no uh, clear statements, no, no role, no roles, uh, just, just all our complexity and, uh, and our ambivalence. That wonderful note. <laughs> oh, one more question? Okay, the last question. Oh, yes. Um, just on to sort of step away a little bit from the creative process and think about the practicalities of working as a writer um, and being a woman and being an individual in society who must survive and make a living. I'm a writer and an educator myself, and I. I I frequently find myself negotiating between the two worlds, which is better. <laughs> Does, is it, and I guess my question is like, what is your experience, not just surviving, but thriving as a writer? 
and as a woman, uh, does that change? Does it make, I mean, one often thinks of like, I think we should ask Claudia, like, what, what does it feel to be a man? <laughs> 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 I mean, I, one thing I was thinking about, I don't know what it feels like to be a man, I have no clue. Um, but, uh, in, I mean, I, and I'm not, I also don't know what it feels like to be a writer, because I'm actually m a much more a, sc a scribbler uh, than a writer. I mean, I'm not a, a, a fiction writer, except to the extent that historical writing or writing for the papers is fiction, which is a large extent. Um, but. Uh, I think that one of the issues in Mexico that has to do with this is, and, th and this may be more sociological, is that there's there's such a presentism in Mexico right now, in my view, that um, what, what was discussed here as, as prestige has to do with, I think, a, 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 an era of intellectualism that ran against the grain a little bit with regard to the presentism. And I think that part of the... Um, the, let's say, suffusion of male presence in in the in the journals, and this has has to do with real, actual occupation of space. I don't know how to how to say it otherwise. I mean, there's a kind of just um, a, 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 the presentism in that I that I see in Mexico, and I and I have engaged in it. I engage in it because I write in the papers, and so you know, some some of us do. And when you write in the papers, it's it's this, just uh, you know, you sort of if you, you, you write it, you, you press send, boom, it's out there. You know, it's kind of like it it it, it has. I, I, I thought of it as kind of instant gratification and instant regret. It's really like potato chip, <laughs> and I, 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 it's something like that. You know, it's like the, 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 my brother wants to find McDonald's is the fastest way to go from desire to regret. <laughs> and that's and that's what writing for the papers is the fastest way to go from desire to regret. And that that little cusp between desire and regret is, it seems to be, very male dominated right now in Mexico for reasons that would deserve, I think, some reflection and, and criticism because I don't think it has much to do with novels and I don't think it has anything to do with poetry. I think it has something to do with. Um, this kind of ether that is the presence somehow, and, the, and, and, the, and it does have to do actually with domination of the space, because this business that you were talking about, vida and everything, mm -hmm. is really what's what's blunt about it, is that it's what it's pointing out is right. domination of the space, regardless yeah. of quality, it's just domination of the space. Yes. I think one of us, not trying to say something so that he doesn't dominate the final space. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even though he's so smart. <laughs> well, okay, I, no, 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 I can't say, no, 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 I yes, can't say, no, no, I was going to publicly confess for feeling terrible for dissing Octavio Paz. Really, I don't, because I, no, his poetry is incredible, so please do not get the wrong impression, I'm playing the role of Moderator, and his poetry being controversial. and his mind. Yes, his of poetry course. and his yes. mind, and he was a wonderful conversator. Yes, and he, his, his, he, to talk with him was always so nourishing because he really was had wisdom and and was so warm. Uh, I adored him. Yes, oh. Sor was better. Sor was much better. But Sor was much better. But he wrote about Sor Juan. He wrote about Sor Juan. But uh, maybe, maybe a good way to end is by saying that um, men are really cool. <laughs> I love men. I really do. I'm a whore. I'm a whore. <laughs> 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 if I didn't have such a poetry, I'd be a whore. <laughs> so here you go. <laughs>